If the Soviets knew that the radiation from space would instantly kill their cosmonauts, as Jera and other conspiracists suggest, why did they even have a manned lunar program? And if the Soviets knew that the Apollo program was a hoax, why didn't they just fake their manned lunar program as well? Think about it. Who would call their bluff? If the U.S. was to come out and say that a manned Soviet space flight outside the Van Allen belt was impossible, how could they possibly continue with the Apollo program? All the Soviets needed to do was fly an empty spacecraft around the moon and bring it back before Apollo 8, and then claim there were cosmonauts on board. Using Jera's logic, since the Soviets used a different radio frequency than the U.S., no one would be able to pick up their radio communications to know if anyone was on board or not, right? What could possibly stop the Soviets from parading their supposed moon men around the world in triumph? The U.S. couldn't very well call foul if the Soviets could turn around and expose them for doing the same thing, could they? You really want me to play another flashback? Okay, here goes. Other propagandists have argued, why didn't the Russians fake their own manned moon flight? Who's to say they wouldn't have tried? On page 173 of his book, The Last Man on the Moon, Gene Cernan of Apollos 10 and 17 had this to say. Zone 5 carried another unmanned Soyuz spacecraft around the far side of the moon, and the voice of a cosmonaut was heard sending back computer readings. It was only a tape recording, but it had shocked the hell out of us. Now, Suppose it was never officially revealed that the voice came from a tapes recorder, and the Russians handpicked a false hero from their cosmonaut corps for the world to worship. Wikipedia identifies the cosmonaut's voice, or more accurately voices, as belonging to cosmonauts Pavel Popovich of Vostok 4 and Vitaly Sevastinov, who later flew Soyuz 10. Although, Wikipedia erroneously attributes this tape recorder stunt to Zonda 6, not Zonda 5. In any case, why did the Soviets reveal that it was just a tapes recorder? Why didn't they just keep it a secret and claim Popovich and Sevastyanov were actually aboard? I don't know. Maybe it's because, at the time of Zonda 5, NASA officially wasn't planning a manned moon flight until at least April or May 1969. Apollo 8 was originally scheduled to be the first flight test of the CSM and lunar module in Earth orbit. But the development of the lunar module hit so many snags that it wouldn't be ready to fly until at least January 1969. In the meantime, US spy satellites had spotted the N1 on the launch pad, and now Zond had become the first unmanned probe to return to Earth. Fearing losing out to the Russians, albeit fearing losing out to a faked Soviet flight, as was demonstrated by the tapes recorder incident, the Americans made the decision to move the LM-CSM Earth orbit flight to Apollo 9, and secure themselves the position of the first around the moon by sending Apollo 8 there without the LEM in tow. In other words, the Soviets had their opportunity to claim that they were the first around the moon. But unfortunately for them, it seems they were honest enough to admit that they had used a tape recorder. After which, NASA announced the change in Apollo 8's flight plan. Don't! And the conspiracists claim that the U.S. was blackmailing the Soviets to keep quiet. That the U.S. threatened a wheat embargo if the Soviets should disclose what they knew about the fake Apollo missions is an anachronism at best. The U.S. didn't sell much of anything to the Soviets in the 60s. The first major wheat deal was cut between Nixon and Brezhnev months after the first SALT talks, which were in May 1972, just four months before the Apollo program ended. Correction. The first wheat deals between the U.S. and Soviets were during the Kennedy administration. President John F. Kennedy approved the sale of four million tons of American wheat to the Soviets just months before he was assassinated. Another 15 million tons had been sold to the Soviets by America's allies. In Time magazine, Kennedy was quoted to saying, This transaction has obvious benefits for the US. It would be foolish to hold the sales of our wheat when other countries can buy wheat from us today and then sell its flour to the communists. 
He also said that turning the deal down would only convince Russia that we are either too hostile or too timid to take any further steps towards peace, that we are more interested in exploiting their internal difficulties and that the logical cause for them to follow is a renewal of the Cold War. Well, what about Carter's 1980 wheat embargo in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Wouldn't that have been an ideal time to counter blackmail the U.S.? Why didn't the Soviets say, lift the embargo now, or we go to the world with what we know about your moon hoax? We know radiation would have killed your astronauts, and we've got the data to prove it. The Carter Wheat Embargo was in 1980, a good five years after the United States and Soviet Union conducted the Apollo-Soyuz test project, and agreed to work cooperatively in the exploration of space. The American and Soviet spacecrafts docked in 1975 in what was considered a major achievement in space exploration. It was also hailed as a breakthrough in international relations. The Soyuz Apollo project is not forgotten, at least in Russia. That's a turning point for the collaboration between Russia and the United States. Oklahoman Tom Stafford was the American commander. He maintains strong friendships in Russia and even adopted two Russian sons. I'd really broke open the Iron Curtain, that mission. And I think when people look at it, they understand that, the, that this was the beginning of all this international cooperation. Exposing Apollo this late in the game would serve no purpose other than to break up a new working business relationship. Amazingly, although this film was made in response to a brief passing mention of radiation in space, Webb says very little about radiation at all. He waves his arms around, saying that the Soviets were not concerned about radiation, and goes off on various other tangents when his own sources he provided substantiate exactly what was said in the book. Really, Webb, you disappoint me. I was actually expecting you to flat out exploit the Zond 5 mission, as other propagandists have done. Oh yeah, why have they exploited it? To recap, we know that an hour's trip through the radiation belts posed a severe threat to the Apollo astronauts. As would cosmic radiation and solar flares, minor or major. And we know from Noah's CFI that major flares did indeed occur during the Apollo missions. And together, in spite of their differing proposals, John Malden, Gene Parker, Ernest Opek, and Werner von Braun all proposed meters of shielding against the radiation, be it a thick outer hole of water or six feet below ground. So. What evidence do we have that men could indeed have lived to tell about their journeys? Oh, that's right, the Zond 5. On September 15th, 1968, Three months before the historic Apollo 8 mission, the Soviet Union launched their Zond 5 spacecraft. It became the first unmanned spacecraft to circumnavigate the moon and return safely to Earth. Aboard the spacecraft was a biological payload of two turtles, which survived the journey. Propagandists praise this mission because they say the survival of these animals is proof that men can survive the journey. Jay Windley is by far the worst offender. In his review of A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon... Zon 5 flew turtles around the moon and back in 1968, returning the turtles alive and safe to Mother Russia, without six feet of lead. And in his response to Wayne Green... On the Soviet side, Zond 5 flew various biological samples, plants and animals, through the Van Allen belts, around the moon, and back again to Earth. The samples were recovered alive and intact. And finally, 
in his response to Dr. Neville Jones. And on the Russian side, Zond 5 sent a number of biological samples around the moon and back, including two turtles, and these specimens were recovered alive upon the return to Earth. Dr. Jones simply hasn't done his homework. This is by far the most ironic statement on the entire Clavis website, because had Jay Windley done his homework, he would have known that the lethal dose for turtles is 15,000 rad, well in advance of the lethal dose for humans. I told this to Windley, who promptly told me... There were other specimens of wards on five. Oh, Jay. If you only spent more than five seconds researching this, you would have known that all the specimens aboard Zond 5 could take greater doses than humans. Wine flies and mealworms, plus 5,000 rad. Seeds and plants, depending on their species, anywhere between 2,000 rad and 15,000 rad. Bacteria, 100,000 rad. Getting your facts right before making bold claims, priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. It seems that Ralph René apparently agrees with us when it comes to the immense radiation that insect life can take. On page 130 of his book, when discussing a rather questionable chart from Noah, he writes, Whoever wrote the chart below must believe that the poor and powerless are similar to cockroaches in their ability to harmlessly absorb huge amounts of radiation. And later, on page 149 and 150, At this exposure, they all should have died in space. These men are as radiation resistant as cockroaches. It is important to note that by his own admission, Windley has read Renee's book. Therefore, he is very aware of the high levels of radiation insect life forms can take. And yet, on May 7th, 2008, when discussing Zond 5, Jay Windley made probably the most ironic and dishonest statement in his entire life. Other specimens were also sent. The turtle is just the most famous. The point of the exercise was to determine biological survivability in space as a prelude to human exploration. That's not accomplished by sending very hardy species, but rather species whose suspectability is commensurate to humans. But as we've just demonstrated, the respective life forms aboard Zon 5 can take doses between 2,000 rad and 100,000 rad. And what about humans? As John H. Walden tells us on page 226 of his book, death is likely after 500 rems in any short time. A human being's 500 rad death dose to a plant's 2,000 rad death dose does not even remotely constitute to being common threat. So, by Windley's own admission, the Zond 5 flight was an invalid experiment because all the specimens aboard were quite, as he put it, hardy.